this is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Simon Slater seems to be in the house. Now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, all right. You're back. You're doing well. It took you 17 hours. Is that because? Oh, God. I mean, just a nightmare, as it always does. Delays you know? galore, or is it just delays? Go to the airport, wait, blah, blah. Where'd you fly? When I'm back, I feel fine. Milan. Okay. Uh, I know it should take it should take it should take eight hours, eight hours. Well, look, two hours in advance at the airport, uh, half an hour to get there, an hour once you're here, two and a half hour delay, blah, blah. I'm fine. Nobody sat next to me. No, well, it's it's I took a test. I don't have covid. I was just in Israel, Athens, one hot spot, one not. The UK, France, and Italy, but once again, negatives in seventy-seven. I'm impressed. Um, Me too, and that was on the uh, tour with Mark Rotato doing the tribute to Alan Vega and suicide, and we had a guest of Blaine Reininger in Athens doing violin on one song. It was fantastic. Great time, and of course, Sebastian Greppo, the grappler, was our assistant, so everything went well. But seventeen hours is that? Why you arrived early this morning? Oh, no, I arrived last night at around to my house at around six, six thirty. Okay, all right. You know, a nine hour flight. Why? Because two hours delay, two hours to get there, blah, blah. I mean, by the time I left at 8 a.m., 830 Italian time and got home at 6 p.m. You do the math Uh, long enough. I've been with you almost all the time. It's everything goes smoothly with you. Yeah, well, an occasional delay. Every now and then it happens, but you you, you play. I have to say, yeah, I'll play cool. I have to say, nobody sat next to me, and the guy across the aisle kind of looked like Richard Ramirez. He was really freaking handsome. So that entertained me for a little while. Well, all right, cool. You you did some eye flirting, or you just kind of did some voice? Well, you know, I mean, uh, I had a feeling he preferred dead bodies, and I was might have been a little too lively, so I just Ah. I left him alone. Well, speaking of yeah. someone who's who wasn't left alone. Oh, uh, Christopher Spaulding of Rockdale County, Georgia. Um, you know, it's some small little county and the sheriff every month kind of kind of flexes his muscle and he puts out his list of the most wanted. He posts to who's the most wanted. Most and, uh, wanted for wa- whatever. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, it's often really not a whole lot of stuff, but people yeah. have warrants out for their arrests, basically. It's usually some fines, some just bullshit. Anyhow, Christopher Spaulding, he decides to, you know, write in the comments section, how about me? And then and then they basically... Couple, <laughs> what couple, about me? Yeah, what about me? What about couple, me? A couple of minutes later, they, someone who's representing the sheriff's office... Writes wait, back, wait, wait, remind me again, where was this happening? Rockdale County, County, Georgia. All right. So so then they comment back to the sheriff's office comments back. You are correct. You have had to have two warrants. We're on our way. Holy moly. Uh, Well, they they go there and they um, they go there and they arrest (laughs) him. And then they do the whole mug mug shot. And they have the picture of him up there going. We appreciate you for your assistant in <laughs> and your capture. You. Yeah, your capture. Oh my God! Well, you know it, there is no cure for idiocy, but and we know that some of the stupidest shit I've heard in my life is coming out of the mouth of somebody running for Senate in Georgia. Oh right, right, right. right. I have never heard more ridiculous bullshit. Now, when is it? When is that runoff election again? Tonight or something. Okay, oh, but okay. How, however, this could have ended both these problems. A new non-hormonal contraceptive promises to block 98% of the nearly 100 million sperm that are released during ejaculation from reaching the cervix. And the key compound comes from, it's a something you like to eat, Tim. You want to oh, guess? No. At, the key compound comes from, what is one of your top five foods? We've had it together recently. It was delicious. Lobster? You may Yes. Once again, trivia, you win the trip. <laughs> Scientists with Sweden's Karolinska Institute Development of Vaginal Gel using tiny fibrous compounds called chitocins, better chitocins than citizens, that's what I say, <laughs> which are found in the exoskeletons of shrimp and crabs and lobsters. And once applied, the gel lasts for 
several hours and it reinforces the cervical mucus barrier to prevent pregnancy. Now, I just wonder, you know, the horrible fucking joke about smelling like fish. Well, now we're going to smell like well. fish if we're going to use this stuff. But I have a lot of hope for it because uh, vaginal gels like this can be applied in seconds and I'm all for it. I mean, not that I have to worry about it, but anyway, I think this is a great uh, technological. Of well, so they're studying lobsters basically to block new life. Yet yeah, they're also studying them <laughs> for indefinite life because the, the word is lobsters can technically kind of live forever, but just the environment yeah. actually kills them. Well, it's citizens, not citizens, citizen molecules are muco adhesive, meaning they interact with the mucus gel that is in the cervical canal. So by interacting with this mucus, the chitizens close the pores and make it impossible for sperm to penetrate. Now, if you, if you know, a lot of people have, Amen. Like, a lot of people have crustacean allergies, like uh, <laughs> shrimp, lobster, crabs. Yikes. You don't want to find out that way. Well, yeah, do you <laughs> want to get maybe tested, but you know, adult onset allergy, it's everywhere. I don't know. what. Well, all right. Um, <laughs> that, that's interesting. I, I like well, that. Well, I mean, we could go from birth or non-birth to death, but I've got a good one, and I do love returning to New York because human composting, I'm all for it, is a new alternative to human cre cremations or burials, and it's growing in popularity. And in New York, once again, we're number one, poised, actually, we're number six, is poised to become the sixth state to legalize human composting, where... People pay seven thousand dollars to be turned into soil, which is better than seventeen thousand dollars for most funerals. So the bodies are decomposed in the above ground containers and speeds up the process of decomposing and ensures that the remains stay moist and are regularly moved. It's been legalized in California, Colorado, Oregon, Vermont, Washington, and only two hundred Americans have signed up for it. But I'm all for this latest echo craze well, because kind of a a yeah. real reincarnation if you you know your cells kind of yeah turn well they into have they, else, worms and all this they shit. they do have 1200 people on the waiting list so i guess this is so new it's just off the charts so containers of the remains are then stacked in a wall before soil from them is handed back to the family months later so then you can you know put them wherever you want them grow a fucking tree instead of killing one anyway i think this is just a grand so the bill will be legal in new york uh well, it was passed actually in June. So I'm just saying, sign it up. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I'm, I'm I think I'm, I'm down for it. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm all down for it. I went to the uh, Museum of Natural History today. Well, and, and spe I, speaking I, of dead things. Yeah. I, I mean, this, I hadn't been in 10 plus years. It's fucking awesome. I, it's it's just, amazing. It, it's really incredible. And, it, you know, I was thinking about it. If there's not if, if there's nothing in there to interest someone, I mean, yeah. there's so much shit. That just means you're dumb. You have like no curiosity at all. What I mean, was your favorite uh, site there, Tim? Ooh, uh, tough one. I if mean, you had to pick one, I know. Well, the thing is, as soon as you walk in, you're bombarded. You're bombarded. So I, I happened to walk in like on the North Wing, which was the North American mammals. So you have all this taxidermy. Oh, woolly from, mammoths. Uh, well, no, 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 no. no these are. Uh, ones that are not extinct yet they have oh. a lot other ones oh. of extinct mammals so this okay is, this so is the like, non-extinct are the first yeah, ones you yeah, see like giant moose and and oh. grizzly bears and all that fun stuff and then did and you stand what, next to a nine foot grizzly by any chance? I, I mean well they had you know behind the glass they had that standing on two feet nine foot fucking grizzly i mean in the giant paws of course the the oceanic part with uh mm. the the big model blue whale wow and, and that's like a hundred fucking feet is pretty spectacular and then of course you have everything in there they have like a, a simulated thing of like tiger sharks chasing a turtle but what's even the coolest is uh, the simulated attack of a sperm whale on a giant squid uh i mean mm. these, these things are really dramatic but you know what i really liked a lot was the pacific northwest indigenous native american section with all these totem pole poles i mean it's just it, it, it's kind of stunning I, I, how, I mean, how I, long did you spend there i'm sure you you would you probably would have liked to have I, stayed till yeah, after they closed on going. I, I a solid a solid four and a half hours Wonderful. well uh you know i you couldn't do it all there's still I, i'm gonna go back and do some more stuff but uh i mean i did go up and see like the dinosaur fossils and skeletons and I mean, it just keeps on going. And then, of course, there's the the, the minerals and the precious pre precious stones 
there, I forget what stone it was. It, it was found in Spain, but perfectly geometrically symmetrical base precious stones that grow right. in like it looks like a perfect cube if like a computer designed it. Amazing, it's amazing. Like, and there's like na- nature made it like really. Well, made. I mean, uh, crystal stones, lava, rock. I mean, nature's full of uh, mysterious designs. Now, speaking once more about why I do love New York. Now, I sent this to you, Tim, because, you know, you never know when you might need a job. But New York City seeks bloodthirsty rat czar as rodents. <laughs> They're okay. So New York City has posted a job for a rat czar and they're committed to wholesale slaughter as uh, as Mayor Eric Adams escalates the war on the burgeoning rodent population. So the city posted a rat pun filled description of the job. And I'm thinking of signing up myself. So the director of rodent migration in New York, which is one of the most uh, important oh, yeah. tasks in the city, the salary, not bad, 120 to 170,000. Now, uh, the ideal candidate, and I'm quoting, should be highly motivated, somewhat bloodthirsty, have a swashbuckling attitude, crafty humor, and a general aura of badassery. Maybe I'll have a job for the first <laughs> time in my life. Do you have what it takes to do the impossible? The description says a virulent ve- vehemence for vermin, a background in urban planning, well, maybe destruction, project uh-huh. management. Yeah. And most importantly, the drive, determination, and killer instinct needed to fight the real enemy, New York City's relentless rat population. I, I, I think it's a great idea. So, I mean, the czar, the rat czar, needs yeah. to, uh, you know, problem solve with strategies like improving operational efficiency, data collection, technological innovation, trash management, and wholesale slaughter. Now, that's something I can sink my teeth into. Well, 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 I mean, I say, why not just buy a thousand cats and let them loosen some well, dogs? They, they, dogs, they, dogs love to hunt. Well, rats. but that's why they don't euthanize our our feral cats. They, they do bring it down, but. The rats Not right enough. Now, I the think rats feral, right now feral, are insane. It's feral so dogs. Insane. It, I don't know. I don't have any around my. I, 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 well, no, but no, but in Manhattan particularly, there's like all the construction. Well, I, I, and I, yeah, one thing. yeah, and I think that they've just invaded the mayor's brownstone, uh-huh. which is why he's on a bender. Hello. It's funny you bring this up because I was in Manhattan last night and I felt bad because you know just like. There's also the homeless uh, problem is. is yeah, sort of right. Like, I mean, and, why don't, and, why don't and, they have a homeless czar? Well, or... no, I, well, I, no, come on. I, I saw I saw a, a homeless guy. I don't mean to get rid of them. I mean to house them and, you know, fully Fair. acclimate. No, I know, yeah. I know, well, this guy was kind of passed out, he was, you know, kind of in a cardboard tent thing that he made. And the fuck he was he really passed out. And rats were just no. running, running oh. all, all like just over him. Where was I, that? Was that a... that, that was um. Like Chinatown, Tribeca. I was going to say Chinatown because they have a big problem in Chinatown. Yeah, it, it was. I was like, oh man, I didn't really want to see it. I felt, I felt pretty it's sad. It's terrible. I mean, I saw a lot of tent cities in, in France. At least they give them tents there. But, and, and one of the saddest sights was in Lyon, where I saw a guy under the train station with his tent dusting it out with a broom. And I'm like, oh my, I, like you got to keep it clean. I know. He didn't have any rats. Uh, well, you know, for that job, when Dave Budden, who we had on the other week, he used to go to O'Connor's in um, right near Barclay Center now. But like, I guess that's Park Slope ish around there. Anyhow. Well, the, the, oh, the no, 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 I, don't no, no, even, I don't even know what to call no, it. Sorry, it was yeah. like Fifth Avenue and. OK, where, where, yeah, yeah it doesn't matter. So, yeah. Um, what is O'Connor's? Well, well, well it, was a, it was an Irish pub and and the and the owner was some Irish immigrant from probably been here for. 30 or 40 years, maybe plus he would, when he did a cigarette break, he would go in the back or the dumpster and there'd be rats scattered everywhere. And he'd be like, cool as a cucumber smoking a cigarette. And he had this kind of Irish, like tough guy club. And he had yeah, insane dexterity my. and he would just be fucking whacking them, like just killing them. Just like, bam, like, cause he'd be on top of the dumpster well, and he'd just be crushing these things left and right. They need a guy like that. I mean, I, I'm sorry to say, uh, love animals as I do. I never met a rat. I loved. Well, Human, maybe, but yep. no, no, no. Well, um, let's see here. Um, here's a, <laughs> a, a well, Got a happy uh, ending for this one. I don't know if you like cops or not. I mean, I mean, I mean what do you mean a... you don't know if I like them? <laughs> well, this is not well, a happy ending. It's not by the happy... way, by the, by the way, 
in Athens, I did stay across the street from one of the worst police stations, and I did go over there and make a few of them crack a fucking smile because they didn't know have any idea what the fuck I was thinking. How did anyway, you determine it was one of the worst? I've been told, so that okay, therefore yeah, I was corrupt, interested. Okay. Well, well yeah, most funny. of them are, but whatever, you know. Well, well you know, you know. Well, me. this cop was not lucky. Austin Walsh of uh, Brevard County, Florida. Um, he and his roommate, he's a young cop. He's only 23. He and his, he, he and his roommate was another cop, Andrew Lawson. And it's some like, uh, okay. And pity is young cops have to have roommates because their pay is so fucking low well, and who are they go. hiring? Okay. Carry on. So they, so there they are and they're kind of off duty and you know, they're, let's, I don't know if they're the brightest guys based on this story. So, uh, well, it's Florida, right? <laughs> it's Florida, but, well, so they're, they're playing video games. Uh, -oh. uh, yeah, it's a Saturday. They're kind of horsing around. They have some friends around, blah, blah, blah. They're all taking a break. I think there's some video game where they're competing with each other. And his, yeah, the roommate, Andrew Lawson, pulled what he thought was oh, an yeah. unloaded, unloaded gun, pointed it at him, pulled the trigger. Boom. And of course, it wasn't unloaded. Bang, bang. And he changed the life. Lives of many people oh my for the, for I mean, forever. So this is why I stress the importance, and maybe I have to start my own institution of serious gun training, not fuckery, not gun fuckery. Please, this again is another example of not knowing how to handle your instrument, and I'm talking about whether it's an appendage, a guitar, or a gun, and doing something extremely fucking stupid. And it's done on a mass scale every day in every country, but especially here. Welcome to America, asshole. I love it. Well, uh, do you want more stories? We're going to wrap it in, wrap it up and go into our guest. Timothy Seymour Dahl, you and I could talk and probably will for the rest of our lives. But I think for the brevity of this intro, perhaps we'll just wrap it up and go on to our next guest which in this our 100 and what episode i don't even know i gotta check that 78 178, uh, 178 episodes of the lydian spin we're having a friend of yours a very interesting artist who creates her own instruments and does a very unique form of noise music now victoria shen does she like to go by Eviction, or is that just one of her albums or performance name? Well, we're gonna have to ask her because I only known her as Victoria Shen, and I, when I see her, uh, you know, being promoted on shows, it's well, I, I'm very interested. I'm very interested in having her on because I mean, there are more women doing noise music, or should I say, noise anti music now. But she's very unique in the in the fact that she invents all of her own instruments, and I can't wait to talk to her. So this is the Lydia a lot more than that. Yes. She, I, I hope we can squeeze it out of her. Oh, yes. This, Because she looks very squeezable, if you ask me. Besides the fact she's a genius. This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Victoria Shen Eviction coming at ya. This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch. Tim Dahl episode like one million five thousand three hundred and twenty two, or at least it should be because I love numerical insanity with special guest Victoria Shen eviction. She performs under she's a instrument maker. I want to say anti composer, um, an anti musician genius. And I don't even know how the hell she does what she does, but we're here to talk about it. So welcome, Victoria. Thanks, Lydia. It's really wonderful to be here. You know, there's something I read this quote and I loved it. And I just want to start off with this because I thought it was so interesting. In one of your interviews, um, you said, and excuse me if I slightly misquote, I can't escape my body. My body is very much part of my performance. The part of the body is like an identity. It's like parrying various heavy identity, like fem femininity. It's like baggage. It has all these meanings. The pregnancy of meaning versus the void of meaning, which is like noise versus signal, because there's no meaning to noise. I found that so interesting. You end it with the interface between these two things, all the meaning and power, especially of the female, quote unquote, body and its power 
and all the misinterpretations or interpretations based then with the pairing of noise up to the listeners. And again, as is femininity or the body interpretation, a very unique pairing. Yeah, thanks. I think it's uh, it's all due to uh, <laughs> having to deal with uh, inserting my kind of body in something that traditionally is not used to having this shape uh, or baggage in the in its dialogue or in its context. So, uh, <clears throat> and like, I think one of the most common things people ask me, especially before, I think it's less and less now, is uh, what is it like to be a female musician or anti-musician like in a man's like noise or music well world. you know i like to turn it around and say how do you think it feels to be actually be a man in a woman's body doing whatever the fuck i want to do excuse me very much why is this still so freaking unusual right right i and think you, it, yeah go ahead with uh sorry just with like more uh, acceptance of like gender fluidity and like non-binariness i think that question is becoming less and less common which is great because it's kind of an annoying question I think that just reinforces the same kind of stereotypes that they're trying to whatever overcome. So why don't I mean, they just a, ask you what it's like to be a fucking female genius? Hello. There you go. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the environments that you're in and, and the demographics you're around, I would assume, I don't know. It's it, as you're saying, it's kind of tipping more in a, in a more enlightened way regarding all these things. So when you do come across, say, someone who coming at you with the kind of banal, whoa, uh, I haven't seen a woman do that or something. Well, kind of make bullshit. instruments like, and I mean, make a well, lot of weird so banal, noises that maybe give me a hard on or prevent me from having one for six months. Do you shame yeah. them? Do you, do, do, do you shame <laughs> them usually? Or do you kind of just like, oh, whatever, you, you, you plight about it? How do you tend to uh, approach that when someone comes to you? from an ignorant angle. Well, no, I think uh, approaching like naivete with naivete is probably best. I what think, do you like, mean? Like, <laughs> what yeah, do you mean? well, I mean, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's a great approach, uh, which I, I think usually makes people kind of have to confront their own naivete. naivete. And then I think you know, if they're being sincere, then you don't want to punish someone for asking something, you know, from like a place of sincerity, you know? So in like, we've been steeped in this kind of underground for a long time. So not everyone has. And then, you know, if you immediately alienate someone who's trying to understand, that's also kind of- well, I mean, also what's interesting to me is, you know, people ask me that question a lot coming up when I did, but coming up in no way, there were so many women on the scene and nobody was searching for a commercial identity. I mean, a lot of, they weren't, there were filmmakers, there were photographers. There weren't that many female graffiti artists, but there were a few. There were, you know, women doing all kinds of things and coming out of the sexual so-called revolution and post Vietnam and that fuckery and the summer of hate. Uh, we didn't really, we didn't really consider our gender was a fucking threat. <laughs> Mine still is. It's not definable assholes. So let's talk, I mean, you're, you're kind of a, renaissance person also i mean you you have uh we're mostly i guess gonna be talking about your music but you also have these other careers you also teach right are you mm -hmm. teaching right now yeah at, at stanford uh, i'm teaching at stanford and uh sva uh school of visual arts new york yeah. remotely yeah remotely okay and what are you teaching uh i'm teaching a sound art class for sva and then i'm teaching just kind of like digital fabrication stuff at stanford just well like, i uh, i read that you have you have some 3d printers it's very interesting to me oh, i'm yeah. very much into 3d houses 3d stakes i don't know if you ever made one of those that's just so weird to me <laughs> i do i really i've eaten some 3d steak it's disgusting well <laughs> you gotta know who your dealer is i guess i don't know but I think 3D, it's just so fascinating. It's, I think it's really great that you're educating the public. I mean, we should be going 3D on a lot of shit. Yeah. Houses, yeah. I mean, especially. I mean, so so if, you're, totally. if you're working on that, and obviously you bring those worlds together. I mean, you're an engineer, right? Do you view yourself as an engineer and you're also a musician and be kind of... In some ways, yeah. I think it's just like... Uh problem solving of a very kind of like a midpoint problem solver not highly advanced not like too primitive just somewhere in between okay uh, yeah not, not to digress too much but i i mean where what's the future of uh manufacturing what's your can you 3d print another one of me because there'll never be another one 
Well, how do you do no, that? No, we can't 3D print your consciousness yet, but we might be able oh, to soon. AI. We might have an artificial Lydia at some oh, point. Well, some people think I'm already on the seventh version, so whatever. But yeah, Tim, yeah. Go with your question again, Tim. Well, Sorry. But, but, but the question is, you know, something like 15 years ago, I was, I'm still very ignorant about all that stuff. I was, say, I was reading some articles, they're like, oh, well, you know, Asia, cheap, cheap labor is maybe on the it's it's on the tail end of the industrial revolution and then automation and, and home manufacturing is maybe the future. Is that true or is that too overly simplified? Where, where do you see that going? No, it's totally true. I think um, the biggest threat to well, quote unquote, threat to artists or like the biggest whatever elephant in the room that we have to confront is like artificial intelligence it's like if you give ai or a model like enough sample enough data of your, your own work your own music whatever it will be able to kind of reproduce a sort of like approximation of what it sounds like and probably even do it quote unquote better, better too. well right, right, does right. the word artificial not tell you something <laughs> hello well, no, but, and, but, and, but wait, wait, in a sense, I think that there is going to be, look, it serves its purpose, but there will be then a primitive rebellion against it as there's always a rebellion against everything anyway. Totally. I think it's kind of like the Greek myth of like Pygmalion, right? The guy who like builds a sculpture and falls in love with it or even like the golem, right? Like the Jewish thing or like you, you build this thing that ends up destroying you. So I think that's, I think more, that's yeah. Victoria. I think that's called civilization. Yeah. <laughs> that's in a nutshell. What That's was true. the first what was the first instrument that you actually decided, OK, I'm going to build this thing. And how simple or complex was it? Like, just I'm going to build this thing. Uh, I mean, the first instruments I built were under the tutelage of Jessica Ryland, this like synth builder when I was in college. Uh, so I was getting paid to do that. So I guess like the first fuck, what was the first thing? I mean, I built a dulcimer like like in a wood shop. Maybe that. <laughs> That's something uh, I built. Oh, yeah, yeah. I built like this thing with, with like two servos and a spring between the two servos and the servo would like stretch the, the spring out over this board that I had like nailed pegs into in the, sh in the shape of the constellation of the Virgo constellation. So, and so after, your, <laughs> after your first kind of musical instrument, then you said, OK, I'm going abstract right away. Ah, <laughs> uh, fuck. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. I honestly, the first kind of music that I was doing, I wanted to emulate Lightning Bolt. I was in like a, a girl band with like a, a drummer and I, we were doing like guitar and synth shit. I would like mic up her, her kit and we would like play together as this like single organism. Uh, and then just packing the guitar was so fucking annoying. I was like, fuck it. I don't need this. So I just went straight synth and I started touring alone because she had a, a real job. I guess I had a real job too. But um, yeah, and then I started touring solo and that's when I went much more abstract. But like the synths that I were building were built for like mostly noise musicians uh, and like that kind of world. Uh, this was under Flower Electronics. Like they had the Little Boy Blue synth, the Jealous Heart synth, all these kind of cool, cool electronics. We like reverse engineered a uh, foot pedal for Roger Miller for Mission of Burma. It's like, so just kind of weird projects like by that. the way you mentioned mission of burma and at least once a week that's when i reach for my revolver oh, my yeah. mission of burma goes through my head i'm just saying yeah hit a nerve yeah hit a nerve <laughs> yeah classic cool. classic song but uh well i think retrovirus of, needs to cover that tim just saying yeah. i'd be up for it i'd be up for it i mean did yeah. you fall i mean kind of going back and running with what you're you're talking about how did you fall in love with music? I mean, you said you wanted to be in a band kind of similar to Lightning Bolt, but as a child, were you in love with music? Were you listening to the radio or were you, what, what was it? Were you taking piano lessons? Was, was it more, what, what, what was your earliest relationship with music? Oh yeah, I mean, I've, I always, always, always loved music, like love dancing. Uh, and uh, I guess like my first, uh, my first CD was like Aqua, which is I'm a Barbie girl. And then my second CD was Corn Issues. So kind of the whole gamut. Wait, wait, Corn? Corn? Yeah. Oh, corn wow. with the K, yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> you're so and weird. I had to, uh, you're, really, you're, you're weird. And I really like that about you. <laughs> oh, no, it's, I have hardly, but like, uh, I had to trick my uh, godmother into buying me the Corn CD because she doesn't, she didn't read English. And it had a parental advisory thing. So that's how, 
And I still feel guilty about it to this day. But anyway, oh, yeah, that. never looked what did up. What did corn lead you to? Oh, just new metal and kind of like the dark side of music and anger. It's socially acceptable, like anger, I guess. And like, you know, this kind of expression. It's like almost like German expressionism, right? It's this sort of twisted, distorted. Do you uh, think that more realistic Do you think that noise is the ultimate stream from the dark night of the battered soul? God damn, I'm a poet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes and no. Yes and no, because I think pop music is also a very dark sort of uh, manifestation. Oh, it's dark, that. dark, it's dark. What is Stop. that sound? Wait, 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 the, the toilet noise. flushing at Simon's? I've got no idea. I don't know. Uh, pop music is the dark bank of the money machine we will never be part of. I, did you, uh, so you, you got into experimental stuff. Did you eventually beforehand or after or ever get into kind of the more I, I, classical new music, experimental stuff of the 20th <laughs> century? I mean, yeah. did you, did totally. you, were you into that before you were into the kind of like, say like the underground noise scene that you were involved with in new England or were you, was that something you let that, that led that, led you to that the more yeah i think new music came later and it's so weird to draw this kind of like artificial line Mm -hmm. i think that line has to do with like where you get your money from if you get your money from an institution then you're in new music if you get your money from a promoter in a basement then you're not (laughs) sure (laughs) sure i mean but but there was also i mean the darmstadt school those guys came from you know boulez and all that stuff they came from a, a a tradition that you know, they were connected. Boulez was connected with Paris and, and mm-hmm. Messiaen. So, I mean, yeah, that, that was something also something different. But uh, yeah, That's I'm true. just curious. Uh, when when you when you're about to record, stuff. when you're about to record something, mm-hmm. Victoria, because yeah. your stuff is so live in the moment happening in that space of time, whatever's free flowing, as you as I've read in some of your interviews that a lot of the times you can't predict what the instrument is going to do. So it is like an active chaotic member. So how do you decide when you're going to actually record something? Is it an improv thing? It's like, okay, that's it. How do you, how do you go about doing recording something like this? Is it live? Is it? Uh, so a, a few different ways. I'll get back to your question, Tim, in a sec, but like um, it's a, uh... Yeah, so I record my live performances, every single one, and it doubles as a sort of like time or two. I know when like I've hit the the mark. And then, um, so I'll intercut that with recordings that I do of like just synth shit, or if I have an idea like, oh, what if I do this with a record with a nail and here and do this kind of like juggling with like between my fingers. And then, so it comes from a number of different sources, but in the end, like the arrangement process is highly different than the live performance like, arranging is really difficult for me it's kind of like the same reason I don't sing or have lyrics it's just this it's composing is not second nature to me at all well trust <laughs> any time you have something you'd like me to experiment as a composer with I love cutting shit together yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's a very different thing and I know a lot of improv artists I mean it is in the moment So you record live, you record live, you might go in the studio and there, there could be a number of combinations of what ends up as the final event, but I really do enjoy mixing other people's stuff sometimes. So Victoria, so (laughs) talk about the the tour. Just flirting. No, I believe that. Um, yes. Anytime, Lydia, (laughs) let's splice. Um, Sorry, or scissor, whatever the the parlance is. <laughs> let, 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 let's talk about the tour you just came off of. What, yeah, you were it? you were in Europe oh, yeah. at the same time. You were doing a massive European tour as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I was there for six weeks. Uh, the last four weeks, I was opening for Clipping. Do you know these guys? For like, who? Uh, for Clipping. Who? They're like this noise rap group that formed, I think, in like 2010, 2011. With, did you hear uh, that? Wait, did you hear that, Tim? That cut out when she was saying their it, name. It keeps on getting cut out when you when you say their name. Can you just say it? it again? Oh shit! Sorry. Uh, clipping. clipping <laughs> Speaking clipping. of clipping, are they br- that... are they British? Are they British? No, they're from LA actually. Okay. But uh, I was hilarious because uh, one of the producers I listened to his band in high school, Captain Ahab, uh, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's it's incredible. It's pretty much it's like kind of like hard techno music 
with um, this bi kind of singing lyrics from the perspective of females from different walks of life over this hard techno. And it's like really graphic and hilarious. So I listened to that a shit ton in, in, in high school. And then in college, I listened to flipping a lot. And it's noise based rap music. And like the, uh, the rapper is Dubby Diggs, who's in the play Hamilton. That's what he's, I think, most best known for. Well, yeah. okay, that, that, that whole thing is sounds so insane and kind of delicious. Um, being a fan of some, especially old school rap music or just the lyrical content of, of rap. And the, I'm gonna check out check out clippings. Yeah, clippings. Check them out. They're incredible. So, were you yeah. touring with them the whole time, or did you go off and do your own thing as well? Uh, the first two weeks, I was doing my own thing, but then the the last four weeks, we were in the van together, we were on the plane together, we were in the train together. Um, That's a lot of shows to be able to pull off at this point in Europe. Yeah. No, I'm really glad it, it happened. Like some of the routing was insane. We were just like kind of all over the fucking place. But um, it was it's fucking crazy because like this last year has been sort of insane in terms of the people I've been able to tour with. Like I toured with Machine Girl earlier this year uh, and their digital hardcore uh, guys like really kind of like trashy and also like live bass and live drums. Anyway, they're also amazing. Uh, and <laughs> they went viral on TikTok. And so they would sell out these huge venues like 600, 700, 800 cap. But the bar would make no money because everyone was under 21. <laughs> crazy and it was oh, funny. Boo -hoo for the bar all right right no and i would open for them and it's a noise act and a lot of these kids it was like you know we've been in lockdown for two years at that point a lot of these kids it was like their first show ever and their first show ever is going to be with a noise musician i was like that was like losing your virginity to anal sex was what i was like <laughs> kind of like now things ever going to be the same and, and rough <laughs> rough rough it would be how yeah. long were your sets when you're doing? Uh, do you have a perfect amount of time? Do you feel you have to play for a certain amount of time? Uh, not, not, not with that tour. In Europe, I felt pressure to kind of stretch things out a little bit longer. But uh, yeah, but in. Well, know, what do you think was, the perfect set is for you lengthwise? I think 35 to 40 minutes is perfect. Yeah. But it depends if it's really intense. Like there was times where like my performance was so intense, I couldn't get out of bed the next day because my neck was so sore. You had a bang over. Minutes. I had a, like huge bang over. Yeah. I mean, I understand <laughs> the bang over. It's not fun. Well, no. I mean, Lydia, Victoria is, can also be very yeah physical in her performance. I've seen um, the bull whip. Yes. I, yeah. Well, one time uh, in Inc. Rap and wires. I, I was doing a show. I was doing a set with Kenny Millions, who was roasting me. I'll, I'll kind of oh, yeah. shrink it down. But as soon as I started, the whole place exploded and Victoria, I think you're standing on a PA speaker. You basically almost swan dived onto Kenny and you're like, you're kind of like bear hugging him as he could barely stand. And then everyone just kind of took your lead and started just kind of beating the shit out of him. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, that was hilarious. Wow. Yeah, that, that was really funny. That, that, that that's was a collective that's Kenny experience. Kenny was very frisky for a man of his age. Uh, he, he can, he can I guess you there. put him in his place. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> It was funny, fun and funny. I mean, it, I have I have to say there's very few events where the lead well, one of the main people on stage is being to a bloody pulp, which is very interesting to me. I fucking dare you. <laughs> but I think those, Usually those are, it's the other way around. Those are 15 minutes, 15 minutes. That's in that. I, I forget. You played a couple sets that that weekend. I, I can't remember, but. Um, where but, where so, was your favorite place in Europe on this last tour? Were there any highlights for you or? <laughs> I think Dublin, Dublin was bonkers. The sound was incredible. The people were so into it. I was getting proposed to in the midtime, like, Marimah, Marimah, hot, no, like by all these drunken lads. It was great, uh, super good energy. Honey, you always got to have the honeymoon first and then sign the prenup and then get a divorce the next day. <laughs> but I mean, you're, 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 as you're saying, you're opening up as a noise act and, and these other acts, are definitely much more in, in, in the popular music or like techno lean, lean, or, or whatever. Or lean, I mean, yeah, well, I, I, if there's dance orient, if it's dance oriented, it's going to bring in, I, I, I hate to generalize, but I think it's true. It's going to bring in a larger audience uh, yeah. in, in general. And, yeah. um, well, I have to ask this because I always, I felt this way often watching some of Weasel Walters shows. Why don't you just have two hot dancers on stage with you while making noise rock? Yes. Oh, that'd be so amazing because I mean, I often when I saw some shows 
let like Jack that that club. I'm like, I had a girlfriend that was almost having a conniption. She wanted to dance so bad to this really out, you know, music. And I'm like, why does nobody ever dance to this shit? It's so psychedelic. I say we need to hire you. Well, some well, that's, dancers. I was kind of going. I need to hire some dancers, honey. I was kind of going in that direction. Yeah. So, so if there's if the headliner is a noise act, did how often do they hire? like a dance act to open up for them. It's usually the other way around, but uh, would you, would you ever consider to hire? I think there's more- some fluidity there. Yeah. I mean, I would love to, you know, container. I played with container. Oh yeah. Container out of Providence. Yeah. Very recently. And he's originally a harsh noise guy. And then he pivoted to like techno and I just love his dance. stuff. But uh, we played together. Fuck. Where was that? I think in. Not like someplace in Europe, I think not. But anyway, he was fucking amazing. I would I mean, if I were like headliner status at some point, I would have him open uh, on the the note of the dancers. I would love to have Buto dancers, you know, just something. Well, I'm, I work. I work. Tim with does. A, I work yes. with Azumi a OE. I don't know if you've seen that before, but yes, I mean, oh, a, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send you some. And, and I have a great friend and she's been on this podcast. Vanessa Sconce is a great Buto and also has done incredible spoken word works in mm. prison with yoga. She's out oh, of wow. Seattle, but I mean, I wasn't think I wasn't seeing Buto, but I was seeing more kind of almost Ian Curtis type herky jerky epileptic seizures, but yeah. maybe married to Vuto. Is is uh what, what's I forget what container what his real name is it maybe it doesn't really matter Ren, but uh, Ren. <laughs> it, did he move did he move to the West Coast? No, he's in London now. Oh, he's in London. I knew he moved. I, that, that's right. Because I, I did some shows with him back in the day, but I, I then I stopped seeing him. I was like, where did he go? But yeah, he moved to London. Yeah, people just get disappear to old country because there's funding there. I think. I want to talk a little bit about your and your your work. You work with American Dreams, which I'm planning on work with next year. And also my good friend Zora Atash is releasing an album in January. I have a track on that with her. and She's dark techno wave um, that the record you did where the cover was a speaker, which I think is just so brilliant. We have to go beyond the CD, the vinyl into something else. Tell us a little bit about the manufacturing. And there were very limited copies, but you made a speaker out of the record cover. That's right. Um, yeah, I, at the time when Jordan approached me, I was just working on making planar speakers uh, at the time, which is just like having a coil and instead of having it be like a three-dimensional coil, you just distribute it over a flat surface. Um, and so like I turned a cassette tape into a speaker, like a drum, like I made like a levitating speaker. And so at this point I was like, oh, I figured out that you could take that coil that spiral and then you could modulate the width of it to like render an image. So I was like, ah, like why not have a a record jacket act as a speaker that can play the record, right? So- uh, It's kind of like- What is that? It's a monster, it's a monster. It's kind of like real modern primitivism because it's primitive with the technology that already exists and you're taking it back to a different format of basic like a pre-Edison kind of thing, which I find very interesting. Yeah. So how, success, how, how successful would you say that? I mean, the idea is great. Did, did, it, did you realize it, would you say, to a level that you yeah. feel satisfied? Great. Yeah, no, for sure. I made a hundred of them and it took fucking ages to make them. Uh, and uh, it, Jordan, the head of American Dreams, he actually like flew out to Boston or did he drive? And then he helped me make them because it took so fucking long. It was so labor intensive which is why people ask me if I'm going to re-release them. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> there is really, a, it, it's something, there's a monster in you. It, a monster. It's your, when you, when you, when you kind of blast the microphone, there's like a, Who, it's, me like a or her? Yeah, it's like, it's like, a, it's, it's you, Lydia. It's a, it's like Excuse a hybrid. Me, between, you, are you saying there's a demon in my mouth? No, it's a hybrid between <laughs> like a, a, a T-Rex and a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks pal. No, By the way, like. next time you're at T-Rex's house, would you mind closing the toilet seat? <laughs> oh my god! I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what that means. So when it so you move back, you're you're in Boston. You're you're you're. I think you're teaching and you're studying in Harvard or I, I don't know and, and Tufts University. And you're so that brought you to Boston. But you're from California originally, and, th- and then you're like, once you I guess completed what you needed to do in the Boston area, you're kind of like out of here, and you went back to. Yeah, uh, it's, it's yeah. it was like a, a couple things. Like I broke up with someone that I'd been with for like seven years. Oh, that's always that. a great period. That's a yeah, great that's period to break. Seven years. 
two, five, seven. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's almost two presidential terms, right? That's perfect. And then uh, also this raccoon came in and slaughtered all of my chickens. Oh. And I was like, wait There's no a minute in there anymore. <laughs> There, there is a monster in my mouth. Wait a minute. What chickens? Uh, I, I owned chickens the whole time I was in Boston. And I well, really uh, loved these, these girls. But um, There is a story about me not having a chicken when I nomaded in Kentucky, but we'll get into that some other time. Is that uh, allowed in Boston to have like uh, lives? Is that, are chickens technically livestock? I guess they are, right? Yeah, they're um, livestock. Uh, yeah. I, I live in Somerville, limit? so it was legal there. But I don't know about Boston, Boston, yeah. Right. So, okay. So, and then the, the chickens. Can I get... just ask why you raised a- eggs? The, the eggs, and they're just, you know, they're very low maintenance pets. And I don't think I could responsibly have a dog or a cat. So, I, I, what, 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 we're going to have a second half. So, maybe when we have the, the reboot, that little monster will be gone. But either that but, or really one of my multiples is coming out like the monster I am. I mean, I mean, but did the neighbors accept the chickens? Because they they they're kind of up early and uh, they can make a, lo- a lot of noise if uh, if your neighbors like to sleep in a little bit. No, they're cool. They're fine with it. When right. I when I when I had a chicken that was not mine in Louisville, the neighbors built it a duplex chicken coop. It laid blue de- blue eggs. And uh, but it was not my chicken. It just adopted me. I did not have a freaking chicken. It adopted the, me. The chicken had you. Yeah. Chicken had me. That's you should, you, Victoria, you should check out the uh, in the I am Ozzy, the Ozzy Osbourne memoir. He talks about his chicken coop and that didn't end up that, that ended pretty badly. Uh, he ended up blowing it up and, you know, oh, shit. With the chickens in there. Well, yeah, well, because his his first wife at the marriage was going south and she thought she would ground him with his drugs and touring by giving him a chicken coop and oh boy and he he's he, it's basically the, he, in that book he's like i don't know what's wrong i i love animals but i keep on massacring them i don't even know what's happening well he i didn't think, bite their heads off that's surprising well, yeah, well, i think a no. chicken coop would be a metaphor for a pretty contaminated relationship i'm just saying i don't know so i mean did you do that do you hate raccoons now uh i think they could be cute but yeah i'm kind of they're yeah. nasty fuckers. Yeah, because yeah. they don't even eat the whole chicken. They just kind of like break open the throat of the chicken and eat the pre-digested food in there. And then that, they leave the rest. So it's oh. nasty folks. Yeah. What is going on? Simon, do you know what this is? I think I think that's I, you, man. I think yeah. Victor, I think Victoria, an instrument has made itself in her presence. I can't hear anything, so it must be me, it's, right? If I don't hear this. I, it's it's like we're <laughs> all Oh, it's shit. monstrous. Yeah. Uh, back uh, to back to biting no, the neck good. open and having the blood spill. Isn't that what we sometimes have to do to our lovers just to get rid of them? Yeah. If you love something, bite its neck out, and if it comes back alive, then wow. Well, you know, <laughs> I I did have two stuffed raccoon heads when I lived in California just to keep them out of my avocado tree. Just saying. I had raccoons on my wall, and we yeah. had to get an exterminator and kill them because, well, they were taking over the house. You well, I'm still coexist. waiting to find that skunk. I'm waiting to find that skunk that supposedly exists in my neighborhood. I've yet to see him, though. I mean, I mean, the the, the world kind of is. It feels more chaotic than ever, but is it? How would you even know? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it is not more chaotic, but we know more about how chaotic it is. Look, Middle Ages, we're here. We're still there. I mean, so much of history is littered with genocidal, homicidal, maniacal, patriarchal, wannabe kings, killing, raping, plundering, exploiting, colonizing, et cetera, et cetera. What's the fucking difference? No. Is it better? Is it worse? How could it be worse? How could it be worse than the Middle Ages? How could it be worse than everything that has happened so far? It's a little better in some places. We just have more access to how horrible it is in most of the other places. Same as it ever was. Do you have a kind of dystopian... What's your What's your read on just the collision of basically our species and technology in the next hundred years. Do you have any predictions you want to share with us? Uh, I feel like everything is really cyclical, right? There's uh, enlightenment and dark ages, but I think those cycles are getting tighter and tighter. I think that's, I think that's pretty much my perspective, whether it's going to end 
in you know sometime within our lifetimes i don't not you sure. know, the thing is, it takes a lot to kill everybody on this planet or the planet itself. We're doing it piece by piece. There's still eight billion motherfucking people. There's still a lot of land unexploited. No matter how many wars and refugees and all the bullshit we do to swallow two plastic bags of microplastics every year, we're still here. And we are not extinct and human life hasn't been reduced. I mean, we used to live to be 30 years old now, 70, 80, 90, 100. What the fuck? OK, we're killing a lot of the animals and a lot of the plant species, but we still haven't found a way to wipe out this problem of overpopulation. A uh, lobster vaginal gel to prevent impregnation. That's on the intro. So, all right. Yeah, you'll have to check that out. Let's, let's move. Sorry. So, mobile, mobile, vaginal gel. That, that, it's, that's, it's, on the in, it's, on, it's on the intro. Mobile <laughs> vasectomy units. Thank you very much. Go ahead. No, that's that is pretty funny. <laughs> I, I just hope you don't have a crustacean allergy. Is well, that the same thing as having crabs? Because I don't oh, think that works. <laughs> that was a good one. Oh, well, God. I think if you have crabs, you might not want to have too much sex unless you want to pass the pleasure on. I don't know. So let's go back to AI, though, in, in the future and, and basically how that's going to relate and what the relationship will be Yeah, with, with artists. I, I know Lori Anderson. She's kind. She has someone who's created some kind of AI for her in, out of Australia. Oh, how unusual for big, expensive, and rich artists! You well, have other people create their fucking work for them. Oh, well, great, yes. Lori. Pass well, some of that. Pass some of that sixty million dollars around, woman. God, well, amen. Yeah, I do. I, I you know. Actually, on that tip, I feel like I recently have been DIY damaged. You know, where your imagination kind of ends at uh, what you feel like you could do yourself by your hands so i think i i don't know i need to learn how to delegate or work on more ambitious projects that take a higher level of production right or more well, abs know. absolutely that's why i have musicians in bands sometimes that's why i use record labels what i don't like is when artists like a kasabi a kasabi like warhol like Lori Anderson now get other people to do the freaking work for them well, to which, help you do the work or to help you finance the work. Yes. But hello, AI in a lich. What she's doing is she's feeding in her previous works and, and making collages of oh, different because they works. were so amazing. All of her. Oh, come on. Well, that, that's that's besides the point. But sure, we, we, we need a recap of all of her. Look, she did some very early experimental stuff i reek the, the point the point wasn't actually to talk about her it's more about oh well, it is do, for do, me do, to talk about people that have 60 million dollars do, and don't give it to people like victoria you or me do you think ai could be used as a tool ethically in, in art if you're saying it could be a threat to an artist if you have people basically just trying to synthesize and, and plagiarize through synthesis through ai versus can just like any tool, you think you can use it ethically. I mean, I, I would say yes, but I'm, I'm curious what you think about. Yeah, totally. I mean, you could do some total like self circle jerky thing and just feed your own art like Lori Anderson and just produce more stuff that you would have done just faster. And maybe it's can... amazing. And, ma yeah. and maybe it's art? amazing the same way that sampling was at first looked down upon. But that, I mean, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think. You know, like everything. I mean, there's going to be good shit and there's going to be a lot of crap. How do you search through it? Well, whatever. Good luck. Oh, my God. Whatever totally. tools it's are available, you should use. Absolutely. It's like photography, right? Photography was supposed to be the end of painting, but there's still painting, right? But uh, I mean, I will say like having lurked in all the discords for like stable diffusion, for disco diffusion, 99% of what people are making, it's just like jack off material for dudes. It's just like, oh, an elf with her shoulder exposed or a beautiful ebony woman. You know, it's mostly women, which is kind of hilarious and sad. But that also bodes really well for artists because artists are doing really interesting stuff and it stands head, heads and shoulders. It's much more distinctive, you know. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to look at it like a good talk. I'm going to look at it like, a, well, look, my phone is fucked up. I could be this. I'm going to say, I'm going to look at it like a guitar. In the yeah. wrong hands, it's atrocious. In the right mm. hands, it's majestic. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, if these, uh, if the AI kind of um, feeding machine, if, you know, 
reproducing music it's like a, a really a cheap app in a couple of years or whatever of course i'm gonna i'm gonna everyone's gonna start experiencing like the hyper inbred just like an ai you know just keep on feeding the same thing to itself indefinitely and of course what's that gonna sound like i don't know a sine wave or something but um so i mean obviously you're mo you're mostly doing a lot of working with your own homemade instruments did you ever learn more traditional I, I know you play guitar but like when you're younger did you ever have any training in a, a more traditional instrument um i think i took like six piano lessons i took i went excuse me i switched from tea to tecate and now i have some burps anyway um yeah i i did percussion in middle school and then i like did guitar in high school so i could play Jimi hendrix stuff but i that's the extent of it um so like, yeah, tabs and, and high school <laughs> or uh, middle school uh, band sort of music theory level stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, this is why I'm kind of sort of attracted to analog material stuff, because this is something that I will never be able to do, like even using tools like CNC, like 3D printing, like digital fabrication, it still is dealing with like the material world. And like, it, I mean, it's so complex and textured and interesting, I think. I mean, that's something that is irreplaceable. It's sort of like kind of our bodies are irreplaceable, like the lumps that we are um, it's, are super unique things. Like the, we're the original NFTs, I guess. Is what I'm trying to say. Materials are the original NFTs. <laughs> and like, why, why would you elaborate on something that's already, you know, so interesting? You know what I mean? Just because something is new doesn't mean that it should be pursued or that it's better. Well, so. just because just because we are the host carriers of thousands of bacteria and viruses doesn't mean that we can't be improved upon or disposed of. We're merely host carriers. Look under the microscope and take an eyelash start there. So how often do you go back to the same? Do you do you tend to go back to the same instruments that you've made in the past? Like this, I like this one. I don't like this one. Or do you? Do you like to kind of constantly just make your next instrument, your next tool? What do you, no, what do you... I, I cycles. I use old standbys for sure. Like, I mean, certain synths and stuff will like fall out of fashion for me, like the Benjolin I stopped using recently. But then I'll reintroduce like kind of old things. Like uh, I made this comb that has like a contact mic in, embedded inside of it. And like you can hear kind of the very unique textures of your hair or whether you're conditioned or not. And it was like it was an initially like a funny take on like the noise generator because it's very difficult to design an electronic noise generator. This noise is random and like random is very rare to find in nature, if at all. So it's like, well, what is the closest approximation to random other than you know the knots in your hair or whatever? And it's just like a white noise instrument. But people have been really resonating with it. They really love it. And I've been using it a lot. And uh, like performances. The way that, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. the way that NASA has been recording black holes, or science can record the sounds of a spider web, I'm just suggesting that maybe you and I could work on something that records the sound of the gut bacteria or the viruses that are all over our skin. So you're dealing now with hair. Can we go deeper? Can we go just, smaller? Yeah, no. For I'm sure. just thinking, you know, I'd love to know what all the gut bacteria, the pounds of it in our belly is saying, because they are our controlling factors. Gut psychology. For nah, sure. Nah, 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 Do you know nah. about brownie in motion? When you go down to like the atomic sizes, like there's everything is always vibrating, right? And that it's <laughs> I wonder if there's a connection with brownie in motion and the brown note. We should figure that out. But <laughs> I mean, you could sonify anything. It's just, yeah. It's just a matter of a max pack. Well, it's honestly. obviously the monster that's been coming out of my mouth on this recording is making this. I, I'm making my own device that's coming out of my mouth. My other mouth. I, I wish monster. I could hear it. Yeah, it, 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 every now and then it's like, a, like after we, when we get excited or something, I, I don't know what that is. It's, uh, there, there's definitely like some kind of, kind of computer demon kind of floating well, around. Well, yeah, the sounds in my head are multiple. And also also your volume went down. I, I don't know what's going on. Well, but, I tried uh, to, I, I, No, 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 Lydia. I tried, to, I tried to adjust it to get the monster out of my mouth. So. I'm picking it up again. There you go. So out of all the instruments you make, 
you know, what would you say? What, what would be your approximation of how many of them are like, eh, that's not going to work? Or do you just kind of just run with that, whatever comes out? You're like, I'm just going to see this through. I mean, how, how often is, do they just kind of, hey, I, I can't really work with this? Or Oh, I mean, all the time. Excuse me. Like, um, I made this uh, glove with tape heads on the, the t- fingertips. And then, like, uh, I was going to have a, like, a cylinder mounted on a stepper motor with, like, tape kind of wound up around it. And then you could play it like this. But it just all sounds like tape noise, just like, woo, 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 woo. so. Um, and then also, I built this instrument for Dillaway recently, Aaron Dillaway, and uh, it's kind of like a tape loop Mellotron that uses eight eight track tape. Um, and uh, it sounds great, but it's like I won't, I'll never use it. <laughs> like it's way too big and impractical and too delicate. That's the thing. It has to be like really hardy for me to like use it especially for life it was is that that was that was that one of the downfalls of the mellotrons just it was just too fragile and it was too moody on the uh, yeah the original mellotron there's always tape jams yeah, always, makes sense. You know, yeah victoria yeah. i don't know why you're making me think of this but going back to the gut bacteria and the sounds it might make i'm thinking that perhaps we could combine a really aesthetically gorgeous vaginal insertion device made of glass that could then pick up the sounds of what's going on beyond the vaginal cavity. Just something to think of. I love glass. I love stainless steel. And I love the thought of all the bacteria that lives inside and on our bodies. This is thoughts you're making me have. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could mm. amplify maybe the muscle, like the myofascial activity that's happening. The there. vibration in, yeah, sure. All the exercises we do down there to let yeah. things in so, or not. You let know, them in. it's it's fucking hilarious that like Lucier and David Ru- Rosenblum were making brain music, right? But this whole time they're putting electrodes on their heads. We could be putting them in the vagina. vagina. Hello, where it counts. <laughs> so, Lu- hello, Lu- is anybody in? <laughs> Out of that whole school, out. Out, out, out of that whole school, that, that whole group between Alvin Luzier, Gordon Muma, Robert Ashley, do you ha- do you have a favorite out of that crew? I mean, I love Luzier, and I almost feel like we're we're totally kindred spirits. And I didn't intentionally model my practice after him, but every live performance is like an experiment, kind of like his, which means that it can fail. So I think that's one of the really nice things about. Uh, my practice is that I do risks that, you know, oftentimes fail <laughs> in public. So uh, that's, I, th- I, think, I, think some, I think some of my best education was doing this is early improv, for instance, opening for the fucking cure with an improv setup that were so atrocious. They gave me a really good lesson in, wow, something can really suck or it can be really great. And it is a matter of opinion. And it was a really good lesson. And that's improv takes that chance all the time. When when you're performing and you're feeling it's not going the direction you wanted or it's or you're just starting to think maybe this isn't very good. Do you kind of do the performance hard sale or do you do you just kind of or do, do you like seeing train wrecks? Do you like seeing train wrecks? I, I, uh, break uh, out the, do you break out the hula hoop? Well, come the on. performance hard sale. Yeah. Sometimes I just cut it short and end on something that I know will work like the whip until the whip doesn't work or something like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, in Europe, I got to say, lady, I don't know if you experienced it at all, this at all. Probably not since you were like a headliner, but like especially the French sound guys love to turn you down, especially they don't understand the music. Ugh. And or they'll put limiters or something to completely right. distort the way your sound is. Oh, is that it again? Did you that, hear that it? Again? Like, it's, it's like there's like some I kind wasn't of even saying reverse, but, but but I mean that, that sucks. Uh, I mean, no, I, no, sound sound men are notoriously incompetent. With that stuff, you have to just tell them like, uh, yeah, no, no limiters, no gates. If you're using a mic, like, like don't do that. But at this time in Europe and some of the clubs I played there, it was the best sound, the best lights and the best stages. And I'm just like, why can't we have any of these in America? We've got like maybe two really amazing clubs that people of our exactly. ilk play at. Exactly. I think I think it has to do with state funding, government funding, because they have the funding there. It's like you could play a show where the ticket sales don't mean anything because they just get funded. I mean, the whole economics of a sound person, well, in, in the United States, is has a whole other problem because they're the, the, in, in a random club. They're the first one there and the last to leave. They have to deal with a million shitty bands all the fucking time. 
And, and, and so really good engineers kind of don't want that gig. What are they going to get at the end of the night? A hundred bucks, 150 bucks. And, and so then, and then of course you, I, you have to treat them like cops. Like if, 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 if they get the impression that you think you're smarter than them, they can ruin your show. Oh, absolutely. And, and yeah. if, and if, and if there's a problem that needs to be solved and you solve it, but you have if to you convince, convince like, them that they solved it. But if you, if you act like me with cops and you just flirt with them and then they want to do well, a really well, the, good job. Well, there's yeah, that. You should flirt with the sound guy. You... I do. No, I do. Yeah. Oh, Unless oh, yes. I want to kill them. Yes, I do. But, but I mean, in France, France was kind of late to like women's rights in terms of voting and all that stuff. Do you think when you mentioned Fran France specifically, you think I think France is backwards in a lot of ways, especially with racism. It's like really horrible. Like if they see a group of brown men congregating of more than like two or three, then they just cops and just come in and just like pat them down. It's just like stop and frisk is is everywhere and especially in Paris. Anyway, that is that aside, I had some really amazing sound guys in France, but some dudes who obviously just put too much ego into their work or into what they think the audience experience should be instead of trying to like work collaboratively with the artist. So what do you hate more? Do you hate a person that doesn't get you and is kind of sabotaging you or one that gets so excited and they feel like they can participate and they still fucking ruin it because they want to be involved in what you're doing? I haven't had that. I haven't no, had that, I, but I, I, <laughs> I will go to the mixing table and I had a lot this <laughs> Few times, I, I guess I would say uh, during this past tour, go back to the sound <laughs> dude mid performance, either hash it out with them or just kind of like uh, take over the territory. <laughs> like, oh, wow. I've, them, I've, to make them uncomfortable. <laughs> I've had some on stage tirades myself. Oh, yeah. Stopping the show and burning some eyeballs, ears, and asses. We have to do it sometimes. I mean, yeah, to get what you want. But anyway, yeah. So, Long story short, couple instances, like two instances where the sound was so fucking bad that I just had to, I felt like I was just performing my way out of a paper bag in order to like make the performance work. Because just, I want to give a deliverable. I'm not going to be like a prima donna and just like pull the, the plug and just say, okay, that's it. Because I can't work here. Just, you just work with what you have. I mean, I just feel I, scrappy. I can make do, you know. I see. I see in your future a portable three D printed sound system mixing board that you can manage from the stage, eliminating the unnecessary need for a dumb sound man. Yeah, I just need to tour with amps. I think that's. Well, I that, need that, to tour that, with that's, amps. That's, that's where I was and, going. I was, I, was, I was curious because because basically, if you're just giving them two channels, or say in most cases, I mean, it's really up to them. You can't just turn around you can't crank your drums and hit harder you can't turn around and turn up your amp you're kind of like, yeah Ugh. right exactly or get your own sound person that is a really that's a really good idea yeah since, especially since you tour solo i mean yeah and when, when you do it. such specific kind of music and you know what you want it to sound like and they may never you could talk to them for three years the sound guy and he's still not going to get it it might be a wise choice for you because they could be like the other unseen important member facilitating the sound you want to make. Yeah, no, I want a fifth Beatle. I do for sure. And uh, when I toured with Machine Girl, uh, their, their sound person, Nico, also did sound for me. And it was just fucking so consistent and so good, like, throughout that tour. That's a really great point. Um, but yeah. That's so who while you were developing your thing you were you were in this band and then you kind of went solo and building synths and just experimenting making your own instruments were you already into quote unquote noise i mean there, there's a long tradition of noise you were already into it do you have any heroes in that quote unquote genre in the, throughout I don't know. You can go back decades, but or favorite any, records. Are, are there any favorite, favorite records, specifically in the noise oh, yeah. category? Do you, who are some of your heroes? I think uh, my one of my earliest heroes was Violent Onsen Geisha. This is uh, he also goes by he goes by hairstylist. He, I think he was signed to to Sony Records, so it was like major mm -hmm. label harsh noise project. Um, and then I just I discovered him through like weird YouTube videos and uh excrete music i think was like the touchstone record where it's like fuck harsh noise is so good you know um and then from there i like went on to like listen to stuff like rubber or cement or like you know more slow incapacity like this type of yeah masana this, this type of stuff but. i've said it before like 
when I first went to Japan, like say 20 something years ago, and, and even though this is still kind of after some of the, the real, the early seeds and the real legends, but still, I, maybe I'm a snob and it, it's just my preference because I think anyone should have the right to do whatever the fuck they want. But there's definitely been a, a change in just the community where it was a little more exclusive it was a little more terrifying. It basically, the filter was a really sort of scary performance that did weed out a lot of people. And j just living in New York and just seeing the new generation, and that's it, this is fine. There is definitely a kind of smiley, everyone can do it, and let's all uh, get along. Uh, Tim, I got to cut in, because music should either make you have a heart on or want to shit your pants or want to cuddle somebody. That's about it. Music has to do one of the three things or it's well, invalid to me. I mean, I do like... Uh, inclusiveness obviously but i also like to be terrified a little bit i want to be a little scared that's my own preference i want to get a boner do you see that do you see that kind of that that trend of like anyone can do it and everyone's kind of s s smiling and do you have a preference of the more terrifying performance as opposed uh, to the more everyone come into the the huddle and hug each other or does it depend I on the space and the people it depends on the space and the people because I've seen harsh noise sets end in a sort of kumbaya moment. But I also think there's like this huge prevalence of like ambient music that and it is very uh, accessible and approachable. And that's not necessarily bad, but it's not my preference. Um, like if I do like a lot of sort of like older ambient shit like uh, Aphex Twin or um, or uh, God, what's that guy's name? Uh, anyway like Vivio, stuff like that. But I think a lot of the recent ambient stuff doesn't really resonate with me. It's just sort of like non-statements or something like that. Uh, oh. And sometimes I feel frustrated, I'm like, ah, make a real fucking noise, like make a sound, you know? Um, but- uh, Give me a I boner. Think, especially for live performance, it's like, you know, there should be, yeah, some kind of stimulation, whether it's like uh, frontal, crotchal, or, you know, aft- Anal. Anal, yeah. Intellectual. Uh, <laughs> Philosophical, anti-philosophical. I mean, I mean that being said, I feel like some of my most valuable moments is like being bored during a live performance. I think that's where I like hit strike upon some of my more interesting ideas. Um, so there's, I, there's a role for everything. Um, I can't be too critical of like what's being made and what's being consumed. I just can't have my own taste. Yeah. When was the last time you you felt a little nervous in a performance? Not not as a performer, but as a as a listener as an audience member where you're like where the fuck is this going like maybe a little danger uh, <laughs> um the cafe auto this um this scottish woman i was performing with uh olivia fury she was uh <laughs> she was going into this sort of like hysterical mode in the middle of her set and like throwing like firecrackers at people and then like screaming at the sound guy and i knew that she's like a really lovely like easygoing person, but like during the bit, I was just like, oh God, I hope the sound guy is emotionally okay. <laughs> She's like, I fucking hate the fucking sound guy. They fucked up with my sound. And this is it. This is what I have to deal with as a woman. You know, all this stuff. And it's just like, whoa, like really intense. So it wasn't like a, oh, I'm in physical danger so so much as like, a, oh fuck, like how are, <laughs> is she going to be okay? <laughs> right, right, right. Anyway, that was, that was like the last time. That was just like four weeks ago. So. Well, it sounds like your tour went very well, and, and and I'm glad. Well, both of you lovely ladies, I go, it sounds like both of your tours went really well, and I'm 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 just happy to hear that. And uh, it seems like you're satisfied. If you can realize whatever you do and be satisfied, I mean, you know, you, that, that's an incredible thing. And uh, I'm so happy yeah, for and, the two yeah, of you. And just for a second, speaking about the advancement in just simple technology, being able to do the songs of Alan Vega and Suicide. And being able to do it with a technology that's far more aggressive, so it takes it to the next level as opposed to just, you know, dream, baby, dream, to really brutalize even more the, the, the psychotic and doo nature of that, especially in a place like France that loved Alan Vega and doing some of the shows with Alan's widow. I mean, it was really grand to just be able to present something that a lot of people never got to see live. And now they're seeing, especially with Mark Rotato, who's just, you know, Ellen Vega times 10, he's insane, um, was great in using the technology that has advanced to that level because I'm not really a techno or even a noise or 
Well, I'm a, I'm a rocker sometimes. <laughs> Not really, you can't find me. But that was fantastic to do that on the road. And so, Victoria, are you, are you uh, going on the road kind of immediately, or what's your next uh, performance uh, out of town? I think my next performance out of town <clears throat> might be Chicago in January, and then it's Oslo for a festival. Um, and then I'm back in Europe in April to. Hey, me too. Hang on. I think nice. I, will, I will be too. So I'll are you going to be... be there for Dano Festival in Austria? I'm going to check that out. Not yet, but I'm going to be there for this big festival in Bourges with the Suicide Tribute. When's the Donner Festival? Dano Fest is the end of April. Beginning. That's great. I, I I was there once before with a live reproduction of my album Queen of Siam in totality, which Carla Boslik put on. But that's a great festival. Yeah, I've never been. I'm really excited to go. And then, uh, oh, I'm doing like a trio with Maria Chavez and Mariam Rezai at the beginning of April throughout like Rewire and um, what's the other one? Oh, God. Uh, it's an end bro. And I've never been. So I'm really excited for that, too. So that'll be fun. So, cool. All right. Well, yeah. well, I hope we cross paths. I, unfortunately, I think, we didn't cross paths this I last time. I think we're going to. Nice. Well, I'm going to be there, too, so maybe all three of us can talk about this. We're going to talk about that later. All right. Well, anyway, thank you, Victoria Shed, uh, Evic Sean, composer of anti-music, noise accelerator, instrument builder, oral terrorist, fucking hottie and a badass to boot. Great talking to you. Likewise. Have a, have, a, have, have a great evening. I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, me too. Thanks for taking the time. The same. Looking forward to uh, seeing you in the flesh soon. Absolute. <laughs>